This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Mutual Aid, A Factor Revolution by Peter Kropotkin Chapter 2 Mutual Aid Among Animals Continued As soon as spring comes back to temp the temperate zone, myriads and myriads of birds, which are scattered over the warmer regions of the south, come together in numberless bands and, full of vigor and joy, hasten northwards to rear their offspring. Each of our hedges, each grove, each ocean cliff, and each of the lakes and ponds with which northern America, northern Europe, and northern Asia are dotted, tell us at that time of the year, the tale of what mutual aid means for the birds. What force, energy and protection it confers to every living being, however feeble and defenseless it otherwise might be. Take, for instance, one of the numberless lakes of the Russian and Siberian steppes. Its shores are peopled with myriads of aquatic birds, belonging to at least a score of different species, all living in perfect peace all protecting one another. For several hundred yards from the shore, the air is filled with gulls and terns, as with snowflakes on a winter day. Thousands of plovers and sand coursers run over the beach, searching their food, whistling and simply enjoying life. Further on, on almost each wave, a duck is rocking, while higher up you notice the flocks of the Kasarki ducks, Exuberant life swarms everywhere. And here are the robbers, the strongest, the most cunning ones, those ideally organized for robbery. And you hear their hungry, angry, dismal cries, as for hours in succession they watch the opportunity of snatching from this mass of living beings one single unprotected individual. But as soon as they approach, their presence is signaled by dozens of voluntary sentries and hundreds of gulls and terns set to chase the robber. Maddened by hunger, the robber soon abandons his usual precautions. He is compelled to retreat. From sheer despair, he falls upon the wild ducks, but the intelligent social birds rapidly gather in a flock and fly away if the robber is an urn. They plunge into the lake if it is a falcon, or they raise a cloud of water, dust and bewilder the assailant if it is a kite. And while life continues to swarm on the lake, the robber flies away with cries of anger and looks out for carrion or for a young bird or a field mouse, not yet used to obey in time the warnings of its comrades. In the face of an exuberant life, the ideally armed robber must be satisfied with the offfall of that life. Further north, in the Arctic archipelagos, you may sail along the coast for many miles and see all the ledges, all the cliffs and corners of the mountain sides, up to a height of from two to five hundred feet, literally covered with seabirds, whose white breasts show against the dark rocks, as if the rocks were closely sprinkled with chalk specks. The air near and far is, so to say, full with fowls. Each of such bird mountains is a living illustration of mutual aid as well as of the infinite variety of characters, individual and specific, resulting from social life. The oyster catcher is renowned for its readiness to attack the birds of prey. The barge is known for its watchfulness, and it easily becomes the leader of more placid birds. The turnstone, when surrounded by comrades belonging to more energetic, energetic species, is a rather timorous bird, but it undertakes to keep watch for the security of the commonwealth when surrounded by smaller birds. Here you have the dominative swans, there the extremely sociable kittiwake gulls, among whom quarrels are rare and short, the prepossessing polar guimots, which continually caress each other, the egoist chigus, who has repudiated the orphans of a killed comrade, and by her side another female who adopts any one's orphans and now paddles surrounded by fifty or sixty youngsters, whom she conducts and cares for as if they all were her own breed. Side by side with the penguins, which steal one another's eggs, 
You have the Dotterels, whose family relations are so charming and touching that even passionate hunters recall from shooting a female surrounded by her young ones. Or the Ida Ducks, among which, like the Velvet Ducks or the Koroyas of the Savannas, several females hatch together in the same nest. Or the Lums, which sit in turn upon a common covey. Nature is variety itself, offering all possible varieties of characters from the basest to the highest, and that is why she cannot be depicted by any sweeping assertion. Still less can she be judged from the moralist's point of view, because the views of the moralists are themselves a result mostly unconscious of the observation of nature. Coming together at nesting time is so common with most birds that more examples are scarcely needed. Our trees are crowned with groups of crow's nests. Our hedges are full of nests of smaller birds. Our farmhouses give shelter to colonies of swallows. Our old towers are the refuge of hundreds of nocturnal birds. And pages might be filled with the most charming descriptions of the peace and harmony which prevail in almost all these nesting associations. As to the protection derived by the weakest birds from their unions, it is evident. That excellent observer, Dr. Coos, saw, for instance, the little cliff swallows nesting in the immediate neighborhood of the prairie falcon, Falco polyargus. The falcon had its nest on the top of one of the minarets of clay which are so common in the canyons of Colorado, while a colony of swallows nested just beneath. The little peaceful birds had no fear of their rapacious neighbor. They never let it approach to their colony. They immediately surrounded it and chased it, so they had to make off at once. Life in society does not cease when the nesting period is over. It begins then in a new form. The young broods gather in societies of youngsters, generally including several species. Social life is practiced at that time chiefly for its own sake, partly for security, but chiefly for the pleasures derived from it. So we see in our forests the societies formed by the young nuthatchers, Cedacacea, together with titmice, chaffinches, wrens, tree creepers, and some woodpeckers. In Spain, the swallow is met with in company with kestrels, flycatchers, and even pigeons. In the far west of America, the young horned larks live in large societies, together with another lark, sprags, the skylark, the savannah sparrow, and several species of hunting longspurs. In fact, it would be much easier to describe the species which live isolated than to simply name those species which join the autumnal societies of young birds, not for hunting or nesting purposes, but simply to enjoy life in society and to spend their time in plays and sports, and having given a few hours every day to find their daily food. And finally, we have that immense display of mutual aid among birds, their migrations, which I dare not even enter upon in this place. Sufficient to say that birds which have lived for months in small bands, scattered over a wide territory, gather in thousands, They come together at a given place for several days in succession before they start, and they evidently discuss the particulars of the journey. Some species will indulge every afternoon in flights preparatory to the long passage. All wait for their tardy congeners, and finally they start in a certain well-chosen direction, a fruit of accumulated collective experience. The strongest flying at the head of the band and relieving one another in that difficult task. They cross the seas in large bands consisting of both big and small birds, and when they return next spring, they repair to the same spot, and in most cases, each of them take possession of the very same nest which it had built or repaired the previous year. This subject is so vast, and yet so imperfectly studied, It offers so many striking illustrations of mutual aid habits, subsidiary to the main fact of migration, each of which would, however, require a special study, that I must refrain from entering here into more detail. 
I can only cursorily refer to the numerous and animated gatherings of birds which take place always on the same spot before they begin their long journeys north or south, as also those which one sees in the north after the birds have arrived at their breeding places on the Yenisei or in the northern counties of England. For many days in succession, sometimes one month, they will come together every morning for one hour before flying in search of food, perhaps discussing the spot where they are going to build their nests. And if during the migration their columns are overtaken by a storm, birds of the most different species will be brought together by common misfortune. The birds which are not exactly migratory, but slowly move northwards and southwards with the seasons, also perform these peregrinations in flocks. So far from migrating isolately in order to secure for each separate individual the advantages of better food or shelter, which are to be found in another district, they always wait for each other, in gathering flocks before they move north or south in accordance with the season. Going now over to mammals. The first thing which strikes us is the overwhelming numerical predominance of social species over those few carnivores which do not associate. The plateaus, the alpine tracts, and the steppes of the old and new world are stocked with herds of deer, antelopes, gazelles, fallow deer, buffaloes, wild goats, and sheep, all of which are sociable animals. When the Europeans came to settle in America, they found it so densely peopled with buffaloes that pioneers had to stop their advance when a column of migrating buffaloes came to cross the route they followed. The march passed of the dense column lasting sometimes for two or three days. And when the Russians took possession of Siberia, they found it so densely peopled with deer, antelopes, squirrels, and other sociable animals, that the very conquest of Siberia was nothing but a hunting expedition, which lasted for two hundred years, while the grass plains of eastern Africa are still covered with herds composed of zebra, the heart beast, and other antelopes. Not long ago, the small streams of northern America and northern Siberia were peopled with colonies of beavers, and up to the 17th century, like colonies swarmed in northern Russia. The flat lands of the four great continents are still covered with countless colonies of mice, ground squirrels, marmots, and other rodents. In the lower latitudes of Asia and Africa, the forests are still the abode of numerous families of elephants, rhinoceroses, and numberless societies of monkeys. In the far north, the reindeer aggregate in numberless herds. While still further north, we find the herds of the musk oxen and numberless bands of polar foxes. The coasts of the ocean are enlivened by flocks of seals and morses its waters by shoals of sociable cetaceans, and even in the depths of the great plateau in Central Asia we find herds of wild horses, wild donkeys, wild camels and wild sheep. All these mammals live in societies and nations, sometimes numbering hundreds of thousands of individuals. Although now, after three centuries of gunpowder civilization, we find but the debris of the immense aggregations of old. How trifling in comparison with them are the numbers of the carnivores! And how false, therefore, is the view of those who speak of the animal world as if nothing were to be seen in it but lions and hyenas plunging their bleeding teeth into the flesh of their victims. One might as well imagine that the whole of human life is nothing but a succession of war massacres. Association and mutual aid are the rule with mammals. We find social habits even among the carnivores, and we can only name the cat tribe, lions, tigers, leopards, etc., as a division the members of which decidedly prefer isolation to society, and are but seldom met with even in small groups. And yet, even among lions, this is a very common practice to hunt in company. The two tribes of civets, viveridae, and the weasels, mustelidae, 
might also be characterized by their isolated life but it is a fact that during the last century the common weasel was more sociable than it is now. It was seen then in larger groups in Scotland and in the Unterwalden canton of Switzerland. As to the great tribe of the dogs, it is eminently sociable. An association for hunting purposes may be considered as eminently characteristic of its numerous species. It is well known, in fact, that wolves gather in packs for hunting, and Chudi left an excellent description of how they draw up in a half circle, surround a cow which is grazing on a mountain slope, and then suddenly, appearing with a loud barking, make it roll in the abyss. Audubon, in the thirties, also saw the Labrador wolves hunting in packs, and one pack following a man to his cabin and killing the dogs. During severe winters, the packs of wolves grow so numerous as to become a danger for human settlements, as was the case in France some five and forty years ago. In the Russian steppes, they never attack the horses otherwise than in packs, and yet they have to sustain bitter fights during which the horses, according to Cole's testimony, sometimes assume offensive warfare, and in such cases, if the wolves do not retreat promptly, they run the risk of being surrounded by the horses and killed by their hooves. The prairie wolves, Carnis latrans, are known to associate in bands of from 20 to 30 individuals, when they chase a buffalo occasionally separated from its herd. Jackals, which are most courageous and may be considered as one of the most intelligent representatives of the dog tribe, always hunt in packs. Thus united, they have no fear of the bigger carnivores. As the wild dogs of Asia, the Colsuns and Doles, Williamson saw their large packs attacking all larger animals, save elephants and rhinoceroses, and overpowering bears and tigers. Hyenas always live in societies and hunt in packs, and the hunting organizations of the painted like Lycaunts are highly praised by coming. Nay, even foxes, which as a rule live isolated in our civilized countries, have been seen combining for hunting purposes. As to the polar fox, it is, or rather was in Steller's time, one of the most sociable animals, and when one reads Steller's description of the war that was waged by Bering's unfortunate crew against these intelligent small animals, one does not know what to wonder at most. The extraordinary intelligence of the foxes and the mutual aid they displayed in digging out food concealed under cairns or stored upon a pillar, one fox would climb on its top and throw the food to its comrades beneath. Or the cruelty of man, driven to despair by the numerous packs of foxes. Even some bears live in societies, where they are not disturbed by man. Dostella saw the black bear of Kamchatka in numerous packs, and the polar bears are occasionally found in small groups. Even the unintelligent insectivores do not always disdain association. However, it is especially with the rodents, the ungulata and the ruminants that we find a highly developed practice of mutual aid. The squirrels are individualist to a great extent. Each of them builds its own comfortable nest and accumulates its own provision. Their inclinations are towards family life, and Brehm found that a family of squirrels is never so happy as when the two broods of the same year can join together with their parents in a remote corner of a forest. And yet they maintain social relations. The inhabitants of the separate nest remain in a close intercourse, and when the pine cones become rare in the forest they inhabit, they emigrate in bands, as to the black squirrels of the Far East, they are eminently sociable. Apart from the few hours given every day to foraging, they spend their lives in playing in numerous parties. And when they multiply too rapidly in a region, they assemble in bands, almost as numerous as those of locusts, and move southwards, devastating the forests, the fields, and the gardens, while foxes, polecats, falcons, and nocturnal birds of prey follow their thick columns and live upon the individuals remaining behind. The, the ground squirrel, a closely akin genius, is still more sociable. It is given to hoarding, 
and stores up in its subterranean holes large amounts of edible roots and nuts, usually plundered by man in the autumn. According to some observers, it must know something of the joys of a miser, and yet it remains sociable. It always lives in large villages, and Audubon, who opened some dwellings of the Haki in the winter, found several individuals in the same apartment. They must have stored it with common efforts. The large tribe of the Marmots, which include the three large genuses Arctomus, Synomus, and Spermophilus, is still more sociable and still more intelligent. They also prefer having each one in its own dwelling, but they live in big villages. That terrible enemy of the crops of South Russia, the Suslik, of which some ten million are exterminated every year by man alone, lives in numberless colonies. And while the Russian provincial assemblies gravely discuss the meaning of getting rid of this enemy of society, it enjoys life in its thousands in the most joyful way. Their play is so charming that no observer could refrain from paying them a tribute of praise, and from mentioning the melodious concerts arising from the sharp whistlings of the males and the melancholic whistlings of the females, before suddenly returning to his citizen's duty, he begins inventing the most diabolic means for the extermination of the little robbers. All kinds of rapacious birds and beasts of prey having proved powerless, the last word of science in this warfare is the inoculation of cholera. The villages of the prairie dogs in America are one of the loveliest sights. As far as the eye can embrace the prairie, it sees heaps of earth, and on each of them a prairie dog stands, engaged in a lively conversation with its neighbors by means of short barkings. As soon as the approach of man is signaled, all plunge in a moment into their dwellings. All have disappeared as by enchantment. But if the danger is over, the little creatures soon reappear. Whole families come out of their galleries and indulge in play. The young ones scratch one another. They worry one another and display their gracefulness while standing upright, and in the meantime the old ones keep watch. They go visiting one another, and the beaten footpaths which connect all their heaps testify to the frequency of the visitations. In short, the best naturalists have written some of their best pages in describing the associations of the prairie dogs of America, the marmots of the Old World, and the polar marmots of the Alpine regions. And yet, I must make, as regards the marmots, the same remark as I have made when speaking of the bees. They have maintained their fighting instincts, and these instincts reappear in captivity. But in their big associations, in the face of free nature, the unsociable instincts have no opportunity to develop, and the general result is peace and harmony. Even such harsh animals as the rats, which continually fight in our cellars, are sufficiently intelligent not to quarrel when they plunder our larders, but to aid one another in their plundering expeditions and migrations, and even to free, feed them their invalids. As the beaver rats or muskrats of Canada, they are extremely sociable. Audubon could not but admire their peaceful communities, which require only being left in peace to enjoy happiness. Like all sociable animals, they are lively and playful, they easily combine with other species, and they have attained a very high degree of intellectual development. In their villages, always disposed on the shores of lakes and rivers, they take into account the changing level of water. Their dome-shaped houses, which are built of beaten clay interwoven with reeds, have separate corners for organic refuse, and their holes are well carpeted at winter time. They are warm, and nevertheless well ventilated. As to the beavers, which are endowed, as known, with a most sympathetic character, their astounding dams and villages, in which generations live and die without knowing of any enemies but the otter and man, so wonderfully illustrates what mutual aid can achieve for the security of the species, the development of social habits and the evolution of intelligence, that they are familiar to all interested in animal life. Let me only remark 
that with the beavers, the muskrats and some other rodents, we already find the feature which will also be distinctive of human communities, that is, work in common. I pass in silence the two large families, which include the Jerboa, the Chinchilla, the Bisatskacha and the Tushkan, or underground hare of South Russia. Though all these small rodents might be taken as excellent illustrations of the pleasures derived by animals from social life. Precisely the pleasures, because it is extremely difficult to say what brings animals together, the need of mutual protection or simply the pleasure pleasure of feeling surrounded by their congeners. At any rate, our common hares, which do not gather in societies for life in common, and which are not even endowed with intense parental feelings, cannot live without coming together for play. Dietrich de Winneckel, who is considered to be among the best acquainted with the habits of hares, describes them as passionate players becoming so intoxicated by their play that a hare has been known to take an approaching fox for a playmate. As to the rabbit, it lives in societies, and its family life is entirely built upon the image of the old patriarchal family, the young ones being kept in absolute obedience to the father, and even the grandfather. And here we have the example of two very closely allied species, which cannot bear each other not because they live upon nearly the same food, as like cases are too often explained, but most probably because the passionate, eminently individualist hare cannot make friends with that placid, quiet and submissive creature, the rabbit. Their tempers are too widely different not to be an obstacle to friendship. Life in societies is again the rule with a large family of horses, which includes the wild horses and donkeys of Asia, the zebras, the mustangs, the chimarones of the pampas, and the half-wild horses of Mongolia and Siberia. They all live in numerous associations made up of many studs, each of which consists of a number of mares under the leadership of a male. These numberless inhabitants of the old and new world, badly organized on the whole for assisting both their numerous enemies uh, and the adverse conditions of climate, would soon have disappeared from the surface of the earth were it not for their sociable spirits. When a beast of prey approaches them, several studs unite at once. They repulse the beast and sometimes chase it, and neither the wolf nor the bear, not even the lion, can capture a horse or even a zebra as long as they are not detached from the herd. When a drought is burning the grass in the prairies, they her gather in herds of sometimes 10,000 individuals strong and migrate. And when a snowstorm rages in the steppes, steps, each stud keeps close together and repairs to a protected ravine. But if confidence disappears, or the group has been seized by panic and disperses, the horses perish, and the survivors are found after the storm, half dying from fatigue. Union is their chief arm in the struggle for life, and man is their chief enemy. Before his increasing numbers, the ancestors of our domestic horse, the Ekius Prevalski, so named by Polyakov, have preferred to retire to the wildest and least accessible plateaus on the outskirts of Tibet where they continue to live surrounded by carnivores under a climate as bad as that of the Arctic regions, but in a region inaccessible to man. Many striking illustrations of social life could be taken from the life of the reindeer, and especially of that large division of ruminants which might include the roebucks, the fallow deer, the antelopes, the gazelles, the ibex, and, in fact, the whole of the three numerous families of antelopides, the Capridis and the Ovides. Their watchfulness over the safety of their herds against attacks of carnivores, the anxiety displayed by all individuals in a herd of chamois, as long as all of them have not cleared a difficult passage over rocky cliffs, the adoption of orphans, the despair of the gazelle whose mate or even comrade of the same sex has been killed, the plays of the youngsters and many other features could be mentioned. 
but perhaps the most striking illustration of mutual support is given by the occasional migrations of fallow deer, such as I saw once on the Amor. When I crossed the high plateau and its border ridge, the great Hringan on my way from Transbalkalia to Meren, and further travelled over the high prairies on my way to the Amor. I could ascertain how thinly peopled with fallow deer these mostly uninhabited regions are. Two years later, I was travelling up the Amur, and by the end of October reached the lower end of that picturesque gorge which the Amur pierces in the Dusalin, Little Hingan, before it enters the lowlands where it joins the Sungari. I found the Cossacks in the villages of that gorge in the greatest excitement, because thousands and thousands of fallow deer were crossing the Amur, where it is narrowest in order to reach the lowlands. For several days in succession, upon a length of some forty miles up the river, the Cossacks were butchering the deer as they crossed the Amor, in which already floated a good deal of ice. Thousands were killed every day, and the exodus nevertheless continued. Like migrations were never seen either before or since, and this one must have been called for by an early and heavy snowfall in the Great Hingan which compelled the deer to make a desperate attempt at reaching the lowlands in the east of the Dus Mountains. Indeed, a few days later, the Dusalin was also buried under snow two or three feet deep. Now, when one imagines the immense territory, almost as big as Great Britain, from which the scattered groups of deer must have gathered for a migration, which was undertaken under the pressure of exceptional circumstances, and realizes the difficulties which had to be overcome before all the deer came to the common idea of crossing the Amor, further south, where it is narrowest, one cannot but deeply admire the amount of sociability displayed by these intelligent animals. The fact is not the less striking if we remember that the buffaloes of North America display the same powers of combination. One saw them grazing in great numbers in the plains, but these numbers were made up by an infinity of small groups which never mixed together, and yet, when necessity arose, all groups, however scattered over an immense territory, came together and made up those immense columns, numbering hundreds of thousands of individuals, which I mentioned on a preceding page. I also ought to say a few words, at least, about the compound families of the elephants, their mutual attachment, their deliberate ways in posting sentries, and the feelings of sympathy developed by such a life of close mutual support. I might mention the sociable feelings of those disreputable creatures, the wild boars, and find a word of praise for their powers of association in the case of an attack by a beast of prey. The hippopotamus and the rhinoceros too would occupy a place in a work devoted to animal sociability. Several striking pages might be given to the sociability and mutual attachments of the seals and the walruses. And finally, one might mention the most excellent feelings existing among the sociable cetaceans. But I have to say yet a few words about the societies of monkeys, which acquire an additional interest from their being the link which will bring us to the societies of primitive men. It is hardly needful to say that those mammals which stand at the very top of the animal world and most approach man by their structure and intelligence are eminently sociable. Evidently, we must be prepared to meet with all varieties of character and habits in so great a division of the animal kingdom which includes hundreds of species. But all things considered, it must be said that sociability, action in common, mutual protection and a high development of those feelings which are the necessary outcome of social life and characteristic of most monkeys and apes. From the smallest species to the biggest ones, sociability is a rule to which we know but a few exceptions. The nocturnal apes prefer isolated life. The capuchins, Cebus capuchinus, the monos and the howling monkeys live but in small families, and the orangutans have never been seen by A. R. Wallace otherwise than either solitary or in very small groups of three or four individuals, while the gorillas seem never to join in bands. 
but all the remainder of the monkey tribe, the chimpanzees, the sajus, the sakis, the mandrills, the baboons, and so on, are sociable in the highest degree. They live in great bands, and even join with other species than their own. Most of them become quite unhappy when solitary. The cries of distress of each one of the band immediately bring together the whole of the band, and they boldly repulse the attacks of most carnivores and birds of prey. Even eagles do not dare attack them. They plunder our fields always in bands, the old ones taking care for the safety of the commonwealth. The little titis, whose childish sweet faces so much struck Humboldt, embrace and protect one another when it rains, rolling their tails over the necks of their shivering comrades. Several species display the greatest solicitude for their wounded, and do not abandon a wounded comrade during a retreat till they have ascertained that it is dead, and that they are helpless to restore it to life. Thus James Forrest, narrated in his Oriental Memoirs, a fact of such resistance in reclaiming from his hunting party the dead body of a female monkey that one fully understands why. The witnesses of this extraordinary scene resolved never again to fire at one of the monkey rays. In some species, several individuals will combine to overturn a stone in order to search for ants' eggs under it. The Hamadrias not only post sentries, but have been seen making a chain for the transmission of the spoil to a safe place, and their courage is well known. Bram's description of the regular fight which his caravan had to sustain before the Hamadrias would let it resume its journey in the valley of the Mensa in Abyssinia has become classical. The playfulness of the tailed apes and the mutual attachment which reigns in the families of chimpanzees also are familiar to the general reader. And if we find among the highest apes two species, the orangutan and the gorilla, which are not sociable, we must remember that both, limited as they are to very small areas, the one in the heart of Africa and the other in the two islands of Borneo and Sumatra, have all the appearance of being the last remnants of formerly much more numerous species. The gorilla, at least, seems to have been sociable in olden times, if the apes mentioned in the Periplus really were gorillas. We thus see, even from the above brief review, that life in societies is no exception in the animal world. It is the rule, the law of nature, and it reaches its fullest development with the higher vertebrates. Those species which live solitary or in small families only are relatively few, and their numbers are limited. Nay, it appears very probable that, apart from a few exceptions, those birds and mammals which are not gregarious now, were living in societies before man multiplied on the earth and waged a permanent war against them, or destroyed the sources from which they formerly derived food. On s'associe pas pour mourir was the sound remark of Espinas and Rousseau, who knew the animal world of some parts of America, when it was not yet affected by man, wrote to the same effect. Association is found in the animal world at all degrees of evolution, and according to the grand idea of Herbert Spencer so brilliantly developed in Perrier's Colonies Animals, colonies are the very origin of evolution in the animal kingdom. But in proportion as we ascend the scale of evolution, we see association growing more and more conscious. It loses its purely physical character, it ceases to be simply instinctive. It becomes recent. With the higher vertebrates, it is periodical, or is resorted to for the satisfaction of a given want, propagation of the species, migration, hunting, or mutual defense. It even becomes occasional when birds associate against a robber, or mammals combine under the pressure of exceptional circumstances to emigrate. In this last case, it becomes a voluntary deviation from habitual moods of life. The combination sometimes appears in two or more degrees, the family first, then the group, and finally the association of groups, habitually scattered but uniting in case of need, as we saw with the bisons and other ruminants. It also takes higher forms, 
guaranteeing more independence to the individual without depriving it of the benefits of social life. With most rodents, the individual has its own dwelling, which it can retire to when it prefers being left alone. But the dwellings are laid out in villages and cities so as to guarantee to all inhabitants the benefits and joys of social life. And finally, in several species, such as rats, marmots, hares, etc., sociable life is maintained notwithstanding the quarrelsome or otherwise egotistic inclinations of the isolated individual. Thus it is not imposed, as is the case with ants and bees, by the very physiological structure of the individuals. It is cultivated for the benefits of mutual aid, and for the sake of its pleasures. And this, of course, appears with all possible gradations, and with the greatest variety of individual and specific characters, the very variety of aspects taken by social life being a consequence, and for us a further proof of its generality. Sociability, that is the need of the animal of associating with its like, the love of society for society's sake, combined with the joy of life, only now begins to receive due attention from the zoologists. We know at the present time that all animals, beginning with the ants, going on to the birds and ending with the highest mammals, are fond of plays, wrestling, running after each other, trying to capture each other, teasing each other and so on. And while many plays are, so to speak, a school for the proper behavior of the young in mature life, there are others which, apart from their utilitarian purposes, are together with dancing and singing mere manifestations of an excess or force of forces. The joy of life and a desire to communicate in some way or another with other individuals of the same or of other species. In short, a manifestation of sociability proper, which is a distinctive feature of all the animal world. Whether the feeling be fear, experienced at the appearance of a bird of prey, or a fit of gladness which bursts out when the animals are in good health, and especially when young, or merely the desire of giving play to an excess of impression and of vital power, the necessity of communicating impressions, of playing, of chattering, or of simply feeling the proximity of other kindred living beings pervades in nature, and is, as much as any other physiological function, a distinctive feature of life and impressionability. This need takes a higher development and attains a more beautiful expression in animals, especially amidst their young, and still more among the birds. But it pervades all nature, and has been fully observed by the best naturalists, including Pierre Huber, even among the ants, and it is evidently the same instinct which brings together the big columns of butterflies which have been referred to already. The habit of coming together for dancing and of decorating the places where the birds habitually perform their dances is, of course, well known from the pages that Darwin gave to this subject in The Descent of Man, chapter 13. Visitors of the London Zoological Gardens also know the bower of the satin bower bird, but this habit of dancing seems to be much more widely spread than was formerly believed, and Mr. W. Hudson gives, in his masterwork on La Plata, the most interesting description, which must be read in the original, of complicated dances performed by quite a number of birds, rails, jacanas, lapwings, and so on. The habit of singing in concert, which exists in several species of birds, belong to the same category of social instincts. It is most strikingly developed with the chakar, chauna chavaris, to which the English have given the most unimaginative misnomer of crested screamer. These birds sometimes assemble in immense flocks, and in such cases they frequently sing all in concert. W. Hudson found them once in countless numbers, ranged all round a pampas lake in well-defined flocks, of about 500 birds in each flock. He writes, Presently one flock near me began singing, and continued their powerful chant for three or four minutes. When they ceased, the next flock took up the strains, and after it the next, and so on, until once more the notes of the flocks on the opposite shore came floating strong and clear across the water. 
then passed away, growing fainter and fainter, until once more the sound approached me, travelling round to my side again. On another occasion the same writer saw a whole plain covered with an endless flock of chakars, not in close order, but scattered in pairs and small groups. About nine o'clock in the evening, suddenly the entire multitude of birds, covering the marsh for miles around, burst forth in a tremendous evening song. It was a concert well worth riding a hundred miles to hear. It may be added that, like all sociable animals, the chakar easily becomes tame and grows very attached to man. They are mild-tempered birds and very rarely quarrel, we are told, although they are well provided with formidable weapons. Life and societies render these weapons useless. That life in societies is the most powerful weapon in the struggle for life, taken in its widest sense, has been illustrated by several examples on the foregoing pages, and could be illustrated by any amount of evidence, if further evidence were required. Life in societies enable the feeblest insects, the feeblest birds, and the feeblest mammals to resist, or to protect themselves from, the most terrible birds and beasts of prey. It permits longevity, it enables the species to rear its progeny with the least waste of energy, and to maintain its numbers, albeit a very slow birth rate. It enables the gregarious animals to migrate in search of new abodes. Therefore, while fully admitting that force, swiftness, protective colors, cunningness, and endurance to hunger and cold, which are mentioned by Darwin and Wallace, are so many qualities making the individual or the species the fittest under certain circumstances. We maintain that under any circumstances, sociability is the greatest advantage in the struggle for life. Those species which willingly or unwillingly abandon it are doomed to decay, while those animals which know best how to combine have the greatest chances of survival and of further evolution although they may be inferior to others in each of the faculties enumerated by Darwin and Wallace, save the intellectual faculty. The highest vertebrates, and especially mankind, are the best proof of this assertion. As to the intellectual faculty, while Darwinists will agree with Darwin that it is the most powerful arm in the struggle for life, and the most powerful factor of further evolution, he also will admit that intelligence is an eminently social faculty. Language, imitation, and accumulated experiences are so many elements of growing intelligence of which the unsociable animal is deprived. Therefore we find, at the top of each class of animals, the ants, the parrots, and the monkeys, all combining the greatest sociability with the highest development of intelligence. The fittest are thus the most sociable animals, and sociability appears as the chief factor of evolution, both directly by securing the well-being of the species while diminishing the waste of energy, and indirectly by favoring the growth of intelligence. Moreover, it is evident that life in societies would be utterly impossible without the corresponding development of social feeling, especially of a certain collective sense of justice growing to become a habit. If every individual were constantly abusing its personal advantages without the others interfering in favor of the wronged, no society, life would be possible. And feelings of justice develop, more or less, with all gregarious animals. Whatever the distance from which the swallows or the cranes come, each one returns to the nest it has built or repaired last year. If a lazy sparrow intends appropriating the nest which a comrade is building, or even steals from it a few sprays of straw, the group interferes against the lazy comrade. And it is evident that without such interference being the rule, no nesting associations of birds could exist. Separate groups of penguins have separate resting places and separate fishing abodes and do not fight for them. The droves of cattle in Australia have particular spots to which each group repairs to rest, and from which it never deviates, and so on. 
we have any number of direct observations of the peace that prevails in the nesting association of birds, the villages of the rodents, and the herds of grass-eaters, while on the other side we know a few sociable animals which so continually quarrel as the rats in our cellars do, or as the morses which flight for the possession of a sunny place on the shore. Sociability thus puts a limit to physical struggle and leaves room for the development of better moral feelings. The high development of parental love in all classes of animals, even with lions and tigers, is generally known. As to the young birds and mammals whom we continually see associating sympathy, not love, attains a further development in their associations. Leaving aside the really touching facts of mutual attachment and compassion, which have been recorded as regards domesticated animals, with animals kept in captivity, we have a number of well-certified facts of compassion between wild animals at liberty. Max Perty and L. Buchner have given a number of such facts. J.C. Wood's narrative of a weasel which came to pick up and to carry away an injured comrade enjoys a well-merited popularity. So also the observation of Captain Stansbury on his journey to Utah, which is quoted by Darwin. He saw a blind pelican which was fed and well-fed by other pelicans upon fishes, which had to be brought from a distance of thirty miles. And when a herd of vicunas was hotly pursued by hunters, H.J. Waddell saw more than once during his journey to Bolivia and Peru the strong males covering the retreat of the herd and lagging behind in order to protect the retreat. As to facts of compassion with wounded comrades, they are continually mentioned by all field zoologists. Such facts are quite natural. Compassion is a necessary outcome of social life. But compassion also means a considerable advance in general intelligence and sensibility. It is the first step towards the development of higher moral sentiments. It is, in its turn, a powerful factor of further evolution. In the views developed on the preceding pages are correct, the question necessarily arises, in how far are they consistent with the theory of the struggle for life as it has been developed by Darwin, Wallace and their followers? And I will now briefly answer this important question. First of all, no naturalist will doubt that the idea of a struggle for life carried on through organic nature is the greatest generalization of our century. Life is struggle, and in that struggle the fittest survive. But the answers to the questions by which arms is this struggle chiefly carried on, and who are the fittest in the struggle, will widely differ according to the importance given to the two different aspects of the struggle, the direct one, for food and safety among separate individuals, and the struggle which Darwin described as metaphorical, the struggle very often collective against adverse circumstances. No one will deny that there is within each species a certain amount of real competition for food, at least at certain periods. But the question is whether competition is carried on to the extent admitted by Darwin or even by Wallace, and whether this competition has played in the evolution of the animal kingdom the part assigned to it. The idea which permeates Darwin's work is certainly one of real competition going on within each animal group for food, safety and possibility of leaving an offspring. He often speaks of regions being stocked with animal life to their full capacity and from that overstocking he infers the necessity of competition. But when we look in his work for real proofs of that competition, we must confess that we do not find them sufficiently convincing. If we refer to the paragraph entitled Struggle for Life Most Severe Between Individuals and Varieties of the Same Species, we find in it none of that wealth of proofs and illustrations which we are accustomed to find in whatever Darwin wrote. The struggle between individuals of the same species is not illustrated under that heading by even one single instance. It is taken as granted and the competition between closely allied animal species is illustrated by but five examples, out of which one, at least, 
relating to the two species of thrushes now proves to be doubtful. But when we look for more details, in order to ascertain how far that the decrease of one species was really occasioned by the increase of the other species, Darwin, with his usual fairness, tells us, We can dimly see why the competition should be most severe between allied forms which fill nearly the same place in nature, but probably in no case could we precisely say why one species has been victorious over another in the great battle of life. As to Wallace, who quotes the same facts under a slightly modified heading, struggle for life between closely allied animals and plants often most severe, he makes the following remark, italics are mine, which gives quite another aspect to the facts above quoted. He says, In some cases, no doubt, there is actual war between the two, the stronger killing the weaker. But this is by no means necessary. There may be cases in which the weaker species, physically, may prevail by its power of more rapid multiplication, its better withstanding vicissitudes of climate, or its greater cunning in escaping the attacks of common enemies. In such cases, what is described as competition may be no competition at all. One species succumbs not because it is exterminated or starved out by the other species, but because it does not well accommodate itself to new conditions, which the other does. The term struggle for life is again used in its metaphorical sense, and may have no other. As to the real competition between individuals of the same species, which is illustrated in another place by the cattle of South America during a period of drought, its value is impaired by its being taken from among domesticated animals. Bisons emigrate in like circumstances, in order to avoid competition. However severe the struggle between plants, and this is amply proved, we cannot but repeat Wallace's remark to the effect that plants live where they can, while animals have, to a great extent, the power of choice of their abode. So that we again are asking ourselves, to what extent does competition really exist within each animal species? Upon what is the assumption based? The same remark must be made concerning the indirect argument in favour of a severe competition and struggle for life within each species which may be derived from the extermination of transitional varieties, so often mentioned by Darwin. It is known that for a long time Darwin was worried by the difficulty which he saw in the absence of a long chain of intermediate forms between closely allied species and that he found the solution of this difficulty in the supposed extermination of the intermediate forms. However, an attentive reading of the different chapters in which Darwin and Wallace speak of this subject soon brings one to the conclusion that the word extermination does not mean real extermination. The same remark which Darwin made concerning his expression struggle for existence evidently applies to the word extermination as well. It can by no means be understood in its direct sense, but must be taken in its metaphorical sense. If we start from the supposition that a given area is stocked with animals to its fullest capacity, and that a keen competition for the sheer means of existence is consequently going on between all the inhabitants, each animal being compelled to fight against all its congeners in order to get its daily food, then the appearance of a new and successful variety would certainly mean in many cases, though not always, the appearance of individuals which are unable to seize more than their fair share of the means of existence. And the results would be that those individuals would starve both the parental form, which does not possess the new variation, and the intermediate form, which do, do not possess it in the same degree. It may be that at the outset Darwin understood the appearance of new varieties under this aspect. At least the frequent use of the word extermination conveys such an impression. But both he and Wallace knew nature too well not to perceive that this is by no means the only possible and necessary course of affairs. If the physical and the biological conditions of given area, the extension of the area occupied by given species, and the habitats of all the members of the latter, remained unchanged, then the sudden appearance of a new variety might mean the starving out and the extermination of all the individuals 
which were not endowed in a sufficient degree with the new feature by which the new variety is characterized. But such a combination of conditions is precisely what we do not see in nature. Each species is continually tending to enlarge its abode. Migration to new abodes is the rule, with the slow snail as with the swift bird. Physical changes are continually going on in every given area, and new varieties among animals consist in an immense number of cases, perhaps in the majority, not in the growth of new weapons for snatching the food from the mouth of its congeners. Food is only one out of a hundred of various conditions of existence. But as Wallace himself shows, in a charming paragraph on the divergence of characters, Darwinism 107, in forming new habits, moving to new abodes, and t taking to new sorts of food. In all such cases, there will be no extermination, even no competition. The new adaptation being a relief from competition, if e it ever existed. And yet there will be, after a time, an absence of intermediate links. In consequence of a mere survival of those which are best fitted for the new conditions, as surely as under the hypothesis of extermination of the parental form. It hardly need be added that if we admit, with Spencer, all the Lamarckians and Darwin himself, the modifying influence of the surroundings upon the species, there remains still less necessity for the extermination of the intermediate forms. The importance of migration and of the consequent isolation of groups of animals for the origin of new varieties and ultimately of new species, which was indicated by Moritz Wagner, was fully recognized by Darwin himself. Consequent researchers have only accentuated the importance of this factor, and they have shown how the largeness of the area occupied by a given species, which Darwin considered with full reason so important for the appearance of new varieties, can be combined with the isolation of parts of the species in consequence of local geological changes or of local barriers. It would be impossible to enter here into the discussion of this wide question, but a few remarks will do to illustrate. The combined action of these agencies, it is known that portions of a given species will often take to a new sort of food. The squirrels, for instance, when there is a scarcity of cones in the lark forest removed to the fir tree forest and this change of food has certain well-known physiological effects on the squirrels if this change of habits does not last if next year the cones are again plentiful in the dark lark woods no new variety of squirrels will evidently arise from this cause but if part of the wide area occupied by the squirrels begins to have its physical characters altered in consequence of let us say a milder climate or desiccation, which both bring about an increase of the pine forests in proportion to the larch woods, and if some other conditions concur, to induce the squirrels to dwell on the outskirts of the desiccating region, we shall have then a new variety, i.e. an incipient new species of squirrels, without there having been anything that would deserve the name of extermination among the squirrels. A larger proportion of squirrels of the new, better adapted variety would survive every year, and the intermediate links would die in the course of time, without having been starved out by Malthusian compet competitors. This is exactly what we see going on during the great physical changes which are accomplished over the large areas in Central Asia, owing to the desiccation which is going on there since the glacial period. To take another example, it has been proved by geologists that the present wild horse, Equus Przewalski, has slowly been evolved during the later parts of the tertiary and the quaternary period, but that during the succession of ages its ancestors were not confined to some given limited area of the globe. They wandered over both the old and new world, returning, in all probability, after a time to the pastures which they had in the course of their migrations formerly left. Consequently, if we do not find now in Asia all the intermediate links between the present wild horse and its Asiatic post-tertiary ancestors, this does not mean at all that the intermediate links have been exterminated. No such extermination has ever taken place, 
no exceptional mortality may even have occurred among the ancestral species. The individuals which belong to intermediate varieties and species have died in the usual course of events, often amidst plentiful food and their remains were buried all over the globe. In short, if we carefully consider this matter, and carefully reread what Darwin himself wrote upon the subject, we see that if the word extermination be used at all in connection with transitional varieties, it must be used in its metaphoric sense. As to competition, this expression too is continually used by Darwin, see for instance the paragraph on extinction. As an image or as a way of speaking, rather than with the intention of conveying the idea of a real competition between por two portions of the same species for the means of existence. At any rate, the absence of intermediate forms is no argument in favor of it. In reality, the chief argument in favor of a keen competition for the means of existence continually going on within every animal species is to use Professor Gedder's expression, the arithmetical argument borrowed from Malthus. But this argument does not prove it at all. We might as well take a number of villages in southeast Russia, the inhabitants of which enjoy plenty of food, but have no sanitary accommodation of any kind. And seeing that for the last 80 years the birth rate was 60 in the thousand, while the population is now what it was 80 years ago we might conclude that there has been a terrible competition between the inhabitants. But the truth is that from year to year the population remains stationary, for the simple reason that one-third of the newborn died before reaching their sixth month of life. One half died within the next four years, and out of each hundred born, only seventeen or so reached the age of twenty. The newcomers went away before having grown to the competitors. It is evident that if such is the case with men, it is still more the case with animals. In the feathered world, the destruction of the eggs goes on on such a tremendous scale that eggs are the chief food of several species in the early summer, not to say a word of the storms, the inundations which destroy nests by the millions in America, and the sudden changes of weather which are fatal to the young mammals. Each storm, each inundation, each visit of a rat to a bird's nest, each sudden change of temperature, take away those competitors which appear so terrible in theory. As to the facts of an extremely rapid increase of horses and cattle in America, of pigs and rabbits in New Zealand, and even of wild animals imported from Europe, where their numbers are kept down by man, not by competition, they rather seem opposed to the theory of overpopulation. If horses and cattle could so rapidly multiply in America, it simply proved that however numberless the buffaloes and other ruminants were at that time in the New World, the grass-eating population was far below what the prairie could maintain. If millions of intruders have found plenty of food without starving out the former population of the prairies, we must, not, we must rather conclude that the Europeans found a want of grass-eaters in America, not an excess. We have good reasons to believe that want of animal population is the natural state of things all over the world, with but a few temporary exceptions to the rule. The actual numbers of animals in a given region are determined not by the highest feeding capacity of the region, but by what is every year under the most unfavorable conditions. So that for the, that reason alone, competition hardly can be a normal condition, but other, other causes intervene as well to cut down the animal population below even that low standard. If we take the horses and cattle which are grazing all the winter th through in the steppes of Transbaikalia, we find them very lean and exhausted at the end of the winter. But they grow exhausted not because there is not enough food for all of them, the grass buried under a thin sheet of snow is everywhere in abundance. But because of the difficulty of getting it from beneath the snow, and this difficulty is the same for all horses alike. Besides, days of glazed frost are common in early spring, and if several such days come in succession, the horses grow still more exhausted. But then comes a snowstorm, which compels the already weakened animals to remain without any food for several days. 
and very great numbers of them die. The losses during the spring are so severe that if the season has been more inclement than usual, they are even not repaired by the new breeds. The more so as all horses are exhausted, and the young foals are born in a weaker condition. The numbers of horses and cattle thus always remain beneath what they otherwise might be. All the year round there is food for five or ten times as many animals, and yet the population increases extremely slowly. But as soon as the buriat owner makes ever so small a provision of hay in the steppe, and throws it open during days of glazed frost or heavier snowfall, he immediately sees the increase of his herd. Almost all free grass-eating animals, and many rodents in Asia and America, being in very much the same conditions, we can safely say that their numbers are not kept down by competition, that at no time of the year they can struggle for food, and that if they never reach anything approaching to overpopulation, the course is in the climate, not in competition. The importance of natural checks to overmultiplication and especially their bearing upon the competition hypothesis, seems never to have been taken into due account. The checks, or rather some of them, are mentioned, but their action is seldom studied in detail. However, if we compare the action of the natural checks with that of competition, we must recognize at once that the latter sustains no comparison whatever with the other checks. Thus Mr. Bates mentions the really astounding numbers of winged ants which are destroyed during their exodus. The dead or half-dead bodies of the Formica de Fuego, Mirmica Sevissima, which had been blown into the river during a gale, were heaped in a line an inch or two in height and breadth, the line continuing without interruption for miles at the edge of the water. Myriads of ants are thus destroyed amidst a nature which might support a hundred times as many ants as are actually living. Dr. Altum, a German forester, who wrote a very interesting book about animals injurious to our forests, also gives many facts showing the immense importance of natural checks. He says that a succession of gales or cold and damp weather during the exodus of the pine moth, Bombyx pini, destroy it to incredible amounts, and during the spring of 1871 all these moths disappeared at once, probably killed by a succession of cold nights. Many like examples relative to various insects could be quoted from various parts of Europe. Dr. Altum also mentions the bird enemies of the pine moth, and the immense amount of its eggs destroyed by foxes. But he adds that the parasitic fungi which periodically infested are far from terrible enemy than a bird, because they destroy the moth over very large areas at once, as the various species of mouse, Mus, Mus sylvaticus, Arvicola arvalis, and A. Grestis. The same author gives a long list of their enemies, but he remarks, However, the most terrible enemies of mice are not other animals, but such sudden changes of weather as occurs almost every year. Alternations of frost and warm weather destroy them in numberless quantities. One single sudden change can reduce thousands of mice to the number of a few individuals. On the other side, a warm winter, or a winter which gradually steps in, make them multiply in menacing proportions. Notwithstanding every enemy, such was the case in 1876 and 1877. Competition, in the case of mice, thus appears as quite trifling factor when compared with weather. Other facts to the same effect are also given as regards squirrels. As to birds, it is well known how they suffer from sudden changes of weather. Late snowstorms are as destructive of bird life on the English moors as they are in Siberia. And Charles Dixon saw the red grouse so pressed during some exceptionally severe winters that they quitted the moors in numbers. And we have been known and we have known, then known them actually to be taken into the streets of Sheffield, persistent, wet, he adds, is almost as fatal to them. On the other hand, side, the contagious diseases which continually visit most animal species destroy them in such numbers that the losses often cannot be repaired for many years. 
even with the most rapidly multiplying animals. Thus, some 60 years ago, the Suslik suddenly disappeared in the neighborhood of Sarepta in southeastern Russia, in consequence of some epidemics, and for years no Susliks were seen in that neighborhood. It took many years before they became as numerous as they formerly were. Like facts, all tending to reduce the importance given to competition, could be produced in numbers. Of course, it might be replied, in Darwin's words, that nevertheless each organic being, at some period of its life, during some season of the year, during each generation or at intervals, has to struggle for life and to suffer great destruction, and that the fittest survive during such periods of hard struggle for life. But if the evolution of animal of the animal world were based exclusively, or even chiefly, upon the survival of the fittest during periods of calamities, if natural selection were limited in its action to periods of exceptional drought, or sudden changes of temperature, or inundations, retrogression would be the rule in the animal world. Those who survive a famine or a severe epidemic of cholera or smallpox or diphtheria such as we see them in uncivilized countries, are neither the strongest, nor the healthiest, nor the most intelligent. No progress could be based on those survivals, the less so as all survivors usually come out of the ordeal with an impaired health, like the Transbaikalian horses just mentioned, or the Arctic crews, or the garrison of a fortress which has been compelled to live for a few months on half rations and comes out of its experience with a broken health, and subsequently shows a quite abnormal mortality. All that natural selection can do in times of calamities is to spare the individuals endowed with the greatest endurance for privations of all kinds. So it does among the Siberian horses and cattle. They are enduring. They can feed upon the polar birch in case of need. They resist cold and hunger. But no Siberian horse is capable of carrying half the weight which a European horse carries with ease. No Siberian cow gives half the amount of milk given by a Jersey cow. And no natives of uncivilized countries can bear a comparison with Europeans. They may better endure hunger and cold, but their physical force is very far below that of a well-fed European, and their intellectual progress is despairingly slow. Evil cannot be productive of good, as Chernyshkevi wrote in a remarkable essay upon Darwinism. Happily enough, competition is not the rule either in the animal world or in mankind. It is limited among animals to exceptional periods, and natural selection finds better fields for its activity. Better conditions are created by the elimination of competition, by means of mutual aid and mutual support. In the great struggle for life, for the greatest possible fullness and intensity of life with the least waste of energy, natural selection continually seeks out the ways precisely for avoiding competition as much as possible. The ants combine in nests and nations, they pile up their stores, they rear their cattle, and thus avoid competition. And natural selection picks out the ants' family, the species which know best how to avoid competition with its un unavoidably deleterious consequences. Most of our birds slowly move southwards as the winter comes, or gather in numberless societies and undertake long journeys, and thus avoid competition. Many rodents fall asleep when the time comes that competition should set in, while other rodents store food for the winter and gather in large villages for obtaining the necessary protection when at work. The reindeer when the lichens are dry in the interior of the continent, migrate towards the sea. Buffaloes cross an immense continent in order to find plenty of food, and the beavers, when they grow numerous on a river, divide into two parties and go, the old ones down the river and the young ones up the river, and avoid competition. And when animals can neither fall asleep nor migrate, nor lay in stores, nor themselves grow their food like the ants, they do what the titmouse does, and what Wallace, Darwinism, chapter 5, has so charmingly described. They resort to new kinds of food, and thus again avoid competition. Don't compete. 
Competition is always injurious to the species, and you have plenty of resources to avoid it. That is a tendency of nature. Not always realized in full, but always present. That is the watchword, which comes to us from the bush, the forest, the river, the ocean. Therefore, combine, practice mutual aid. That is the surest means for giving to each and to all the greatest safety, the, most, the best guarantee of existence and progress, bodily, intellectual and moral. That is what nature teaches us, and that is what all those animals which have attained the highest position in their respective classes have done. That is also what man, the most primitive man, has been doing. And that is why man has reached the position upon which we stand now. As we shall see in the subsequent chapters devoted to mutual aid in human societies. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.